Okay, welcome. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. So um, in partnership with the league and the Mid-Ulster Academy and our partnership with Have a Soccer Profile, this is a series of webinars and we're delighted to have James on tonight. Thank you, James, for giving up your time to come on. So everybody got a, we got a lot of questions sent in. So Michael's gonna go through the questions. If you could just keep your microphone muted, he'll call out your name. You can ask the question, mute your microphone again, and then chat with James. After the questions are all done, we'll open it up to the floor. Um, what worked really well last time was if you have a question you wanna ask, you can send it through to me on the private chat. Um, and then as they come through in order, um, I'll go through them once we open it out to the floor. All right, Mickey? Yeah. Um, just evening, everybody. Um, I'm not gonna to take too much time on this. We'll just start, uh, whoever's, whoever's in now, we can come back to them. If they're not on, we'll come back to them later on. Uh, first question up is from Craig Nickel from Tully Vallon. Craig, if you want to unmute your microphone. Uh, hello. Uh, my question is, who is the best player you ever played with from Northern Ireland? Um, for Northern Ireland, I think I, I started off at Blackburn and um, there was a, a player called Damien Johnson there. He's played for Northern Ireland. So I, I was with Damien early, early in my career when it first started, when um, it was the old YTS at Blackburn. Um, so I played with Damien and then I went to Southampton and, and Chris, Chris Baird was there. So Baird, Baird he was a good player as well. Um, and then later on in my career, uh, I, I played at Rangers with Stephen Davis. Um, and Stephen's probably the best, the best Northern Irish player I've played against. Um, uh, played with, sorry. Uh, playing against, it probably would have been um, Gareth McCauley was, was quite a tough opponent. Um, and Aaron Hughes as well. So I played against them a few times and they were, they were you know, tough upon opponents. Yeah. Is that all right? Thank you. Yeah, awesome. thank you. James, I, 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 uh, I just don't know if when you were at Blackburn, I went to school with a guy, he was at Blackburn. What might have been around that time, Peter McCann. Peter didn't play at Blackburn when you were there, did he? Peter McCann. Yeah. No. Uh, no, name doesn't ring a bell. No. No. No problem. On mute, Maggie. Hey. Um, next up is uh, Braxton Musto. Braxton, do you want to go fire away with your first question? If you want to unmute your microphone. Go ahead, Braxton. Oh. I maybe asked this question. I think Braxton's got a bit shy on it. Um, well, I just I just asked this question for Braxton. All as Braxton says, as a Sheffield United supporter myself, I would love to know what your timeline was like there at the club. Um, I loved it at Sheffield United. Um, I didn't really see myself or, or want to ever drop out of the Premier League. Um, but the opportunity uh, arose when I, you know, left Everton. Um, I had a slight disagreement with, with Moyes. He said, you're going. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. And then about three weeks later, I was gone to Sheffield United. Um, and it was, uh, you know, a tough decision to drop out of the Premier League because, as I say, I didn't, I didn't really see myself or didn't want to 
drop out of the Premier League, but um, it was a good opportunity to go to a club that I thought had a great chance of getting promotion. Um, and when I went there, it was it was great. I loved loved the club. Uh, there was some really really good people at the club, um, you know, and I loved playing in front of the in, in front of the Blades fans at Bramall Lane. Thank you very much, James. Um, next up, we have Gary Nickel this time. Gary, you want to unmute your microphone? Hi, James. Hi. Uh, I'd just like to know, are you, I'm sure you're glad you played when you did, but would you think you would have succeeded now or would you like to crack to in the present day? Um... I think every I think every footballer still wishes he was playing, but um, I've managed to uh, deal with that in my head um, after a, after a few years. Um, it took me a while to get over it, but I was lucky. I went into into management and then coaching. Um, I think, I mean, I would I would still like to play today, but I think I'd be too physical. I don't think I'd be getting away with much <laughs> these days with VAR. Um, and you know the way the way the game's gone, it's it's a lot a lot less physical. So the tackles that and the challenges that I used to like doing, and we're quite good at, they're uh, they're not in the rules anymore. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I, I, I'm I'm sure that I'd have to adapt, like everybody has to adapt to the rules and and and, and take on board the the rules that are coming in. Um. Hopefully, the you know the the. They go with rules and, and stick with it rather than changing them every few weeks, which I'm sure is difficult for the players now. Um, but as I say, uh, I'd love to play now, but I don't know how, how successful I'd be because I was quite a physical player. And uh, I think that that's being totally sort of, um, you know, drifting out the game a little bit. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next question up is Killian Skelton. Killian, are you in? Uh, I don't see Killian in. We'll come back to Killian later on if, he, if he's not in, then I'll ask the question. Um, next up, we've got Olin McKenna. Olin, do you want to go ahead and unmute your microphone and go for the, your first question? Hi, James. Hi, Olin. What can you do on the pitch when you aren't in a good form? Um, I think there's a there's a few things you can do. Um, speaking from my own experience, I I used to, and and obviously now going into coaching, um, you, you try and revert to your process. So that's you 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 know how how you've trained and how you've prepared for the game. So I think that that can give you you know confidence to keep doing the right things, keep trying to get in the right positions. Um, I think you you self talk as well, being being you know talking to yourself in in a positive manner, um, encouraging yourself you know in your in your own mind. I think that's really important uh, and a good skill to to try and and practice if you can and not beating yourself up uh, because you're not playing well. You know there's enough people around you, you know the fans or whoever will give you opinion on 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 your form. So I think just keeping a positive mindset, remembering your training. Um, you know, remembering the good preparation that you've done um, and just trying to persevere with it and keep trying to get into good positions, keep trying to make the right runs, keep trying to be tidy on the ball. Um, because the, certainly if you're in, if you're in a, you know, a poor run of form, there's one thing that's definitely not going to help you and that's hiding uh, and not being brave, brave enough to, to go and get the ball and then show people what you can do because there's always going to be a point where it'll turn. And then your form will become good again, you know. And then, and then, football's like that. It's it's a it's a series of ups and downs. Whether the ups and downs are are minute by minute, or you know, day by day, week by week, month by month, and then it's just handling them, you know, with perhaps quite a, a level mentality. If things aren't going well, try and stay positive. If things are going well, then just try and not get carried away. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Sean Guest. Sean, if you want to unmute your microphone. Cheers, Michael. Uh, hey, James, uh, long life Blackburn fan. Uh, enjoyed watching him many a time, mostly with youth team and reserves uh, at Blackburn. I uh, just wanted to ask, like, obviously, was it like a, it was tough, obviously, like, of Dalgleish and Pikes and Ray Eiford didn't really get a chance much, and then later on, Ray Edgson, but was it a hard decision to leave Blackburn, or was it quite easy to be able to just go on and progress? Was that, obviously, was it a tough decision, really, though? Um, I, I remember exactly where I was. Um, and like you, I'm a, a lifelong Blackburn fan. Uh, I got my third season ticket when I was seven um, and proceeded to spill a kind of um, vimto on someone. I was in, the, I was in the, the seating area of the Riverside stand on the front row and I knocked a kind of vimto off onto someone's shoulder and it went all over him. <laughs> that was my first ever game at Blackburn. Um, but going, the decision wasn't, wasn't mine. Um, I, I remember I was at I was at um, Cliverow Golf Club playing golf. Uh, I'd had I'd had my debut a couple of years before, and that, and then I'd uh, flitted in and out of you know the odd appearance for the first team, and then playing for the reserves in the A team as it was then. And um, I remember I had it set in my mind that this this next season was going to be my season. I was going to establish myself in the first team, get some goals and then, you know, crack on from there. And uh, I got a phone call from Tom Finn, who used to be the secretary. And he said, uh, we've sold you to Southampton. And uh, I was devastated. You know, it was a beautiful day playing golf. I, I, had, I had all this planned out in my mind and then I got this phone call and then my world just fell apart. And I didn't, I didn't, I started crying, I think. And I was 20 years old. Um, but that's how much the club meant to me. And that's, you know, I had, I had these thoughts in my mind. I'd already mapped it out, what I was going to do. Um, and it happened really quickly. Uh, I didn't have any say in it whatsoever um, because I didn't really, you know, have the standing. I couldn't say, no, I'm not going. Or um, even though I'd lived at home my whole life up until that point, um, you know, playing for your local team, and it happened really quickly. I was down in Southampton within a couple of days. I spoke to Dave Jones, who was the manager of Southampton. I remember meeting him in a, in a restaurant. I had my dad with me. And uh, Dave just mapped out what he wanted me to do at Southampton, how he, how he saw my career going, you know, get into the first team, try and establish yourself, get some goals. Basically the same plan that I had, but at a different club. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I started playing in the first team in November time and I, I managed to go on and get clear at you. But the decision was it was totally out of my hands. I didn't have a say in it at all. Cheers, James. I was. Um, not sure whether, just looking here to see if is Scott McGill in at the minute. No, no Scott at the minute. We'll give it a minute or two, see if Scott comes in. Um, Olin, if you want to unmute un your microphone and ask your next question. Who has influenced you the most throughout your career? Um, I would say probably different, different people at different stages. Um, but there was, there, was always, there was always one constant who was a, a, you know, a tremendous influence on my life. That, that was my dad um, until he passed away in 2011. But my dad was always um, very fair, uh, but he only had to look at me if I played badly or I hadn't performed. He only had to look at me. So I'm sure there's a couple of dads that can relate to that out there. Um, but coaching-wise, there was... Um, a lot of people have influenced me, but the first probable, probably big one was Alan Irving. He was my youth team coach at Blackburn. And uh, Swerve just did, if now now that I'm in this position as a coach, 
we talk about leadership and setting good examples. He was he was the perfect example um, and role model for a young footballer. Um, he was probably fitter than most of us, and he was probably in his early forties. He used to do the running with us in pre-season at Blackburn and beat most of us. Um, he was he was he was harsh, but he was really fair. Um, but and and he didn't just uh, shape us. He was a great coach as well, you know, on the grass. But he didn't just shape us as footballers. He shaped us as young men as well. Um, and I still speak to Alan today on a, on quite a regular basis, and I've got a huge amount of respect for him. Um, but he was, I was probably you know lucky to have him at that stage in my career because he he shaped a lot of um, you know the player that I was going to go on to be. Um, at Southampton, um, you know, I have to thank Dave Jones for, for signing me in the first place. Dave was a, a great fella, um, you know, a, a really good manager, man manager. Um, and then Gordon Strachan was was really good for me um, because as as my as my profile went up, he he knew how to get the best out of me uh, as a manager. Um, again, he was he was he was harsh, but he was really fair. Um, but he also he also um, he commanded commanded respect, not not just from his playing, but the way he treated you. So obviously, respect we know is is mutual and it, and it's earned. Um, but it, it, there was always a line where you knew that if you ever stepped over that line, you were getting it. Well, anything up to that line. He was great. He, you, you used to be able to have, you know, uh, the crap with him or banter and used to be able to hammer him a little bit. But whenever you step too far, he just snap. <laughs> and he, he was he was great. But uh, yeah, still speak to Gordon again up until this day. And he was, um, you know, a big influence. Um, and when I went to Everton, Alan, Ir luckily, Alan Irving was, was uh, the, the assistant manager at Everton. Um, so it, he he was still there, and and then as as you go on through your career, you 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 meet and talk to different people, and uh, I I have my network of people that um, I turn to for advice. Um, you know, it, it, especially now being on the coaching side of it. Um, but probably yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd say Alan Irving was the biggest influence it, on on me. Uh, probably because it, he he caught me earlier and taught me good habits to then take through through my career. Thank you. Thanks. I'll take a breath now. <laughs> um, get a cup of tea. Um, Sean, if you want to unmute your microphone again and go for your your second question there, please. Come on, cheers. Yeah, just lean on to what well, you just asked before to this. So, uh, great coaches that you worked on, like Alan Irvin and, you know, Ray Eiffel, Tony Parks and other ones. Uh, would you say that they're kind of, you know, as a youngster when you're there, 16, 17 year old, is it the coaches more so that can help you with different things technically or, you know, positional play? And then is it more so the likes of, you know, your Chris Suttons and then even when you move to Southampton, you've more experienced players playing as well, you know, do they lend a lot more advice to other certain areas that your coaches wouldn't kind of give? Um, I think, I think again, I, w I was lucky um, going to Blackburn uh, at, at an early age um, because you had, you had Kenny, who was the manager, um, and, and Ray and Tony, and they were brilliant with the young lads. You know, they didn't just concentrate on the on the first team, um, as, you, as you'll know, we we were the first ones to go to Brockhall. So the first team and, and uh, youth team were on the same campus. Um, and they didn't just, you know, walk past you in the corridor. They'd take time to engage with you and talk to you. And then if you were lucky enough to be asked to go over and train with them, you'd obviously um, have their coaching. But... They used to come to the youth games and, and watch the youth games and, and, and speak at half time uh, and then go off to the, the first team game at, at, in the afternoon. Um, it, was, it was brilliant. And I, I, guess, I guess the environment at that time, 
that with Jack Walker, uh, you know, being the brilliant benefactor that he was, he sort of added to that and, and the team was going in the right direction. And, and I, I think I joined, I think it was the year, the year after they won the title. So the, the atmosphere around the training ground was amazing. You know, the, the, you had uh, Colin Hendry, Tim Sherwood, Giro was there. And, and for a young lad to be in that sort of environment with them sort of role models um, and then sort of people coaching you and, and, and not just the football, but little life skills as well. Um, I think, I, you know, it was, it was a great environment to be in. Um, the, the, the senior pros were great as well. Um, and this is something that I, I adopted and took into my, uh, when, I, when I became a more senior player in helping the youngsters and talking to them. Um, I remember vividly, we were, we were in, and it used to be B team, A team, reserves and first team back then, didn't it? And I remember we played for the B team because we were first year YTSs um, and we were all chatting. It was Monday morning and we were all chatting in the room, there's probably 16, 17 of us. Uh, the door opened and it was Shearer. And he just, he came in and he just said, oh, how did you get on at weekend, lads? Mm. And for us, you know, Shearer was our, our hero, he's my hero anyway. He had probably 17 lads with the jaws on the floor just not answering him because he couldn't believe he'd walked into the room. But I, I remember what a profound effect that had on me. So then, you know, it was even for them to say hello to you um, was, was, you know, an amazing experience. But so I took that, as I, as I say, I put that into my um, sort of, uh, that's what I, lends to my personality as well. Um, and I, I did it with, with younger players as I, as I went through my career as well. Cheers, Pete. All right. Uh, Next up, we have another question in from Braxton. Um, I'd maybe just fire this one out if Braxton doesn't mind. Okay. I'll set it out again. Um, Come on, Braxton, you can do it. Come on, Braxton. You want to ask this one, kiddo? Yes. Yeah, good luck. Right, go ahead, buddy. How did you find it working at Sheffield Wednesday after playing for Sheffield United? Oh, I didn't like it. <laughs> Gary, Gary, Gary forced me to go. <laughs> um, it, it was, it, it was, it was okay. I, I, I actually thought that I would get a lot more stick from the Blades fans, but I, I, I know that the, the Blades fans are quite an intelligent bunch, and they, they knew that it wasn't me being a player; it was me being a coach, and obviously the, the two separate things. Aren't yeah. Um, but it was uh, I, I always had one eye on Bramall Lane but don't tell anyone <laughs> thanks you're welcome uh, next up we have a question from Harvey Latimer Hardy do you want to unmute your microphone and give it a go hello James see Harvey Hi. Oh, yeah, all right. See you, mate. <laughs> um, how did you prepare for games? Like, did you have a special routine, say the morning, the morning of the game or the night before, in order to 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 fully be ready for the game? Um, I, I sort of mentioned this uh, earlier. Um, I, I think even the night before the game, or or just directly before it most most of your preparation is done for bit like way before that so i think there's the the things that you do and how you prepare the night before obviously get you know get a lot of sleep or whatever whatever routine that you find works for you then i, I would i would say that that's that's the best thing um what i i i was a, a big believer in process so i mentioned it before and I wouldn't be able to not, you know, train train well on a Monday, train well on, on a Tuesday, um, may, maybe have Wednesdays off in them days, train well on a Thursday and then train well on a Friday. Uh, and then 
you know, if I didn't do any of them bits right, then it used to it used to grind in my head and it used to wind me up and, and you know, drive me insane. So I, I worked out a process that it was, was good for me, that I, I felt happy in my own head that I prepared properly right up to that point. And then the, the sort of night before and directly before games was just the icing on the cake, really, because I was already mentally prepared for, for the game. Um, and then it was just making sure that all the, you know, the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed um, the night before or, or directly before a game. I didn't have any suspicions, at, uh, what well, not suspicions, uh, superstitions. I didn't, I didn't wear the same undies or have the weird socks or anything like that. Um, but I knew that I had to be mentally prepared uh, for the game as well, as well as physically. Cheers. Okay. Thanks, all right. Um, Sean, you have got another one in there. If you want to go for your next one. <laughs> no, but I'll let it. It's my last one then. Um, James, who would you say that out you out most with your England uh, sort of career, like England squad, the uh, staff and, and players? Um, I think the... When, I, I was quite young when I went with England, um, and I was, I was, I was always people that have known me for a long time say I was always a confident person, and I, and I think you have you have to be confident, you know, to 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 go and be able to uh, play your trade on the pitch, you know, because it's not easy um, performing to a level when you when you do cross the white line, but. It was it was it was quite clicky was England. So there was a group of young players, and so maybe me, Trevor Sinclair, Bridgie, Matty Upson, um, and then you had Liverpool, Man U, and and all the bigger teams, and not really any of them interacted with us that much. Um, but the one the ones that did actually might surprise you were were David Beckham, um who was who was really accommodating, came over and made sure we were all right because he knew at one point that he would have been that young lad being integrated into the squad. Um, and Saul Campbell. Uh, and they they were the ones that really made us feel welcome. Um, but I, I, I always felt like I deserved to be there because of, you know, what I'd done and I don't think you get to the that level without without performing well on a regular basis. Um, but I just, I just think, yeah, probably probably them too. Uh, the staff the staff were great with us. Um, I just felt it was a little bit a little bit clicky with the players. Cheers, mate. All right. Uh, Jake Thompson, do you want to? Unmute your microphone, Jake, and ask yours. Yeah. James, you've lined up against some of the best defenders across several leagues. What do you think is more important attribute as a defender? Speed, positional awareness, or being able to read the game? As a defender, um, I think if, if you're looking at a, a, a defender, you, you probably have a, a mixture of all of them. Um, but if, if, if I was to say, I think, I think mental strength is uh, quite a big part in a, in a, in a player's makeup uh, these days. And, and as I said, I mean, being brave on the ball and, and being willing to express yourself in front of people and, uh, and, and not getting overawed by the situation. Um, but yeah, of course, pace and strength, being able to read the game, um, tactical awareness uh, of where you need to be. I think your role within the team and role clarity is important as well. Um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say that. Um, I, I always I always remember when, going back to what I was saying before about being prepared for your game, um, I was sometimes in the tunnel because I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I started football quite late because I was a swimmer when I was younger. So I only started playing football when I was about, about 14. So I had a lot of mental toughness and I knew that I probably didn't have the technical ability of 
um, some of the players that I was I was going up against. But I used to, um, I'll give you a little story. Uh, we were in the tunnel once at St Mary's and we were playing Man, Man United. Um, and I remember walking into the tunnel and I was, I was psyched up for the game. And I remember staring at Rio Ferdinand um, and just kept staring at him. And he got nervous. Um, so I knew at that moment that I was in his head. And then I remember the first challenge, it went up in the air and I, I went into him quite hard, uh, legally, of course. But uh, he knew from that moment that he was going to get a tough game. Thank you. You're welcome. With that, with that legal challenge, James, have got you in nowadays, would it? Yeah, I think so. I used, to be able, <laughs> I used to be able to jump quite high, so I could get my knees into his ribs and stuff like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Very good. Um, Alfie, Dallas, Alfie, do you want to unmute your microphone and ask it, or do you want us to do it for you? Who's the best player you've played against and why? Thanks, Alfie. Um, we'll go def defender, probably, yeah. Uh, probably Sol Campbell when he was at Arsenal. Um, you know, for, for all the um, attributes that, that Jake just mentioned in his question before, um, he was strong, uh, he was quick, he read the game well, he's very tough, you know, as an opponent, very physical. Um, but, the, you know, the best thing, I, I mean, I used to, I used to love uh, playing in physical games. Uh, but the best thing was at the end of the game, we'd always shake hands and, and say, yeah, good battle, because we played against each other a few times. And... Uh, he was he was probably probably the best one. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Harvey, you've got another question there. If you want to, another couple. If you want to shoot in and ask that one. Yeah, James, you're obviously known for coming up against big, strong defenders, as you mentioned, the likes of So Campbell. Um, but how do you approach games against them and? especially winning balls in the air against them? Um, well, as, as, as I say, I, I, was, I was pretty decent in the air. Um, so I, I would back myself uh, against anybody when, you know, when I was in, in, in my prime. Um, but there, there is a... We, we have this thing now where if, if you're a little bit, you know, if, you, if you're not sort of that way inclined and that's not your game, you have to adapt your game to maybe take them out of their comfort zone. So move them away from their strengths. So if their strengths are heading and the physicality, then you have to take them off the, off the straight line. And uh, we work a lot with, um, you know, smaller players on this uh, by, by then gaining the advantage by using their strengths against what might be their weaknesses rather than trying to go head to head with them, start thinking, you know, how can I be clever and, and taking him out of his comfort zone? What does he not want to do? Well, he probably doesn't want to face his own goal, you know, if, if, you, if you're quick, or he probably doesn't want to drop in and, you know, play in front of him on, on an angle. So maybe taking him off the straight line because center halves always like working in straight lines. So if you take him off the line, then you, you gain an advantage, I, I think, uh, and just trying to be just trying to be clever and 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 being more intelligent with your play. Uh, but there's nothing to say that you can't try it every now and again being physical against them. But it's then working out, you know, what what you're good at and and, and realizing what what he, you know, the defender what he, what he doesn't want to do. And I know that for a fact that not. No defenders like facing their own goal. So if you can get the, your teammates to play the balls over the top or down the side of them, um, then trying to yeah, as I say, trying to work out ways and you can you can um, bring your strengths to the fore and then expose his weaknesses. 
Cheers. Uh, next up, Braxton, leave a, another one there, a couple there, if you want to ask the, your next one, and then I'll shoot in with the, the couple that hasn't come in yet. Who was your best striker partner and why? Oh, this is a good one. Um, I had I had a, I had a good few that I enjoy playing with, um, all for all for different reasons. Uh, probably my favourite one was a, a player called Marion Pahars, who was at Southampton with me. He came he came over as a, a probably an unknown unknown player and exploded onto the scene in one of our great escape years. Um, but he he was phenomenal. He had. So much natural talent, could hit shots with both feet, but he was lightning quick. And he's still the only player I've ever seen who can run full pace and change direction 90 degrees. Um, but he was he was brilliant to play with. Um, I think me and him complemented each other well uh, with with the varying styles. You know, I could win the flick ons and he could go with his use his pace to get onto the to the flicks. Um other notable mentions would be Brett Ormerod, who, who was unbelievably fit and just kept running and running and running, uh, which diverted quite a lot of the attention from me. Um, and he was my um, strike partner when I, you know, I got me a, a, me most goals in the Premier League. Kevin Phillips is another one. Um, I enjoyed playing with Duncan Ferguson at Everton. That was that was good laugh. Two similar, you know, centre forwards. That was always uh, that was always funny. Um, uh, yeah, they'll be, they'll be my favourites. Thank you. Thank you. Um, James, I've one in here from Kelly and Skelton, and it says. Uh, do you have any regrets about your career? And if so, what would they, what would you do differently? Um, I've got I've got small small ones, yeah. But I always I always say, um, I don't think I'd be in the position, you know, with with my family. And if if you made any decisions differently, could I have made some better ones when I was playing? Yeah. Um, I suppose that's true for for everybody. Um, but I, I don't. There's no. There's no massive regrets apart from. Uh, I was doing it. I was doing it when I when I was playing for England. I was doing a documentary, and I think that that didn't sit well with the FA. And something. It was. Do you remember when they were striking the players? They were or they were threatening to go on strike. And I did. I, I mentioned something about that, and I don't think it sat well with the FA. And I never played for England again after that. So I don't know whether it was, it was that. But I, I do sort of regret doing that. It was. It was um, a lead up to the 2004 Euros. It was sort of like a documentary, and we had cameras in the in the training um, camp, and I did a little little bit to camera and then they, they aired it and it, I don't think the FA appreciated it. That's great, James, thanks. Uh, Scott McGill, Scott, are you in? Braxton, if you want to go ahead with that other, them other, with that other couple that you have there, if you want to shout on, and then we'll wait and see if what it comes in again. Scott, he was there a minute ago. What was it like when you got that first call up for the England team? Um, it was it was pretty special. Uh, I remember I remember getting a text message. Uh, from someone at the FA um, that I'd got into the squad and it, it was just, yeah, 
amazing fear. I think I've, I think I found my dad straight away. Um, and then I think Gordon Strachan found me straight after. Um, but yeah, it was, was an amazing feeling. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I, I totally thought I deserved to be in it. So I wasn't, I wasn't that surprised. No, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> it was, um, it was, it was, it, it didn't seem real at the time. Um, receiving that text message, because uh, you're always, you always think that somebody could, because of the way that, uh, you know, dressing rooms are, you always think that it was, it was talked about in the papers that I might get in and all that, but you, you just try and concentrate on, on you, on your club game, because that's all that's going to get you there. And I thought, I half thought that somebody was winding me up, so I didn't really buy it straight away until I got, a, until I got a phone call from somebody from the FA. Thank you. Yeah. Braxton, if you want to go ahead with another one, because there's there's one more after this, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So if you want to throw in another question there, then we'll, we'll have one more, and then I'll say I'll open it up to the floor. How have you found the transition from player to coach? Um. As I said, as I said before, you know, you, you, your career. I think I was professional for seventeen years, um, and I, I was I was lucky that I went straight from um, from playing into into managing. I, I went into manage Jackington Stanley for eighteen months. Um, I'm not the sort of person that can sit still uh, for too long. So I'm quite glad that that opportunity came, uh, but I didn't actually see myself retiring at 34. I would have played on for a bit longer, um, but I think that, that that transition was was made a lot easier um, by being, uh, you know, absorbed in in the job that I was doing at Accrington. I remember a little story. It was. The first game that I took charge of Accrington, so we we'd done pre-season, and and everything was fine, um, and then we came to the first game and we were playing Newport County away, and we travelled down to Newport, got to the ground, had a little look around, the players got changed, went out for the warm up, came back in, and I gave my final speech to the team. Uh, and then, as I say, for 17 years, it had been me walking out the dressing room to go and play. So all the players left, the staff left, and then the, I was just on my own in the dressing room. And it was de deadly quiet. There was no sound at all. And uh, I actually, it actually hit me then that my career, my playing career was over. Um, and I was upset. And I nearly missed the kickoff because I had to come, you know, I had to uh, control myself and, and, and calm myself down and then and then go out. So that was a little bit of a you know a culmination of emotions, which is uh, which I'll, I'll I'll always remember that because it was it was that at that present at that you know instant that it hit me that my career was over, my playing career. But I've enjoyed I've enjoyed I enjoyed that job and then I've subsequently you know really enjoyed working. Um, with with Gary at, at the various clubs we've been at um, and I've learned a hell of a lot and I, I love what I do. Thanks. Um, James, I'm going to throw one into you now for myself here. Um, if you had to pick of all the clubs that you've had been at over the years, what do you think was your best goal? Oh. Um, my best one or my favourite one? Um, one? Go for one of each. What's your favourite one and what was your best one, do you think? Um, I think the, the, the best one is... Probably the half volley at Stadium of Light, if you're talking technically. 
um because it i don't know if you've seen it but it, it's the the, the it, Marion goes up for a challenge and it and then it just drops and I just think oh well I'll, I'll hit this and then I, I cut across it and the ball's like rolling back to me and they're, they're quite hard to control that could have easily gone over the stand uh, at the stadium of light which would have been some strike but I just caught it right and it went it went over Tommy Sorrington and then funnily enough I played with Tommy about five years later and it's the first thing he mentioned to me when I walked through the door <laughs> Um, my favourite, my favourite ones are the ones I've scored in the derbies that I've played in. Um, so you know the South Coast derby, the Sheffield derby, Merseyside derby, a any of them ones. You know they, they they mean the most to me, and you know they mean the most to the fans as well. I would say that. Probably scoring probably in a Merseyside derby would probably have been, or a United Wednesday derby would probably be a, a big big one there, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, they were they were good. Um, it was only it was the one in the one at uh, Sheffield was was only an equaliser. You know, only only thing that could make it better would have been if it was a winner, and then it was an equaliser in the um, Merseyside derby. I scored a couple of winners in the South Coast derby, um, but yeah, they're, they're my favourite ones. Thanks, James. Chris, do you want to go ahead there? Yeah, there's a couple through in the chat. Um, Trevor Connolly has sent one through. Trevor, do you want to ask? Unmute your microphone. What's been, what's been the highlight of your career so far? Um, the highlight, probably, probably making me England debut in, in front of my, um, in front of my dad and my mum and dad. Um, I think to, um, I don't, I don't think many people when I was playing when I was younger would have thought that it was possible. Um, but I had, um, just on um, you know really really strong mental strength to to persevere and to keep going and um anytime I got written off which was a lot even you know sometimes by my own manager at Premier League club uh it just gave me determination to prove people wrong and I think that the best thing you can ever do is is do something that somebody says you can't thank you thank you Alfie, Alfie Dallas is another one. Did you train a lot by yourself to make it pro? Um, I, I, as I say, I, re I realised from from an early age um, that I needed. I, I had some catching up to do. Um, I was forever doing extras. Um, in an attempt to, to try and catch up and, and to try and improve. Um, I think we, I think now with, with the introduction of sports science, it's a bit more difficult. And I think um, maybe, maybe coaches and managers are, are a little bit more wary of, of um, too many extras being done. But I was, I was out for when I was younger as a YT uh, and then in, you know, my younger years, uh, when I was at Blackburn and, and at Southampton, I'd, I'd be out for, you know, I, w I was doing shooting practice, free kicks, um, hold up play, getting in line with the ball, all sorts of, all sorts of things that, that I thought could improve me as a player. But now it's a little bit more difficult because if if the players try and stay out, then you have sports science all over you saying, oh, they've, they've done too much running and all this sort of stuff. So now it's a little bit more balanced. But you know, as a as a as a young lad, I think he, you've got so much energy. Um, I have it now with with my son. You know, he, he's torn between going outside and playing football and, and being on his Xbox. You know, and on the one hand, he wants to tell me that he wants to be a professional footballer and 
the next minute he's inside on his Xbox and I say, you won't become a professional footballer, mate, playing on your Xbox. <laughs> You'll only be a, a professional footballer if you put the hours in. Um, you know, and it, it's a lot of, it's a lot of mental, mental strength as well. Um, and the little things that you might find mundane or boring, you know, kicking the ball against the wall or doing keepy ups or doing little skills, they'll all help you. Um, you know, if if your ambition is to become a, a professional footballer, and it, and it's and it's going to take time, it's going to take dedication, um, and it's going to take a, a lot of sacrifice uh, of not, you know, maybe not playing on your Xbox with your mates and going outside with the football, <laughs> getting some fresh air. Thank you. Thanks, Peter Her. Peter, do you want to ask yours? Yeah. I'll Hi, James. How are you? Hi. One second. <laughs> with, um, with the Euros coming up, um, uh, what formation would you play and what would be your start at 11? Oh. England. Um, how long have you got? Oh, well. <laughs> um. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I quite I quite like I quite like um I mean this this is me personally talking. I, I defend in a four four two and then attack as a four two 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 with the wingers, you know, coming inside and the fullbacks providing the width. So whichever you know, whichever players um would suit that system best. We've got a lot of attacking attacking players, haven't we? Um, I don't know if I can do a one to eleven, but uh, I think you know Harry Kane would have to be in there uh, talking about um, fullbacks. It'd be I don't know, um, Chilwell, um, right back. Carl Walker Peters is playing well for me, but never gets a mention uh, in any. You know, predicted England squads, um, but yeah, I think that's how I'd do it. Because then you'd have you, you know, you'd you'd have a good numerical advantage in in midfield with four. A lot of the foreign teams play a three. Um, and then, who would yeah. be your who would be who would be your goalkeeper? Um, I don't know actually, and I, I know. Pickford made a mistake last night, didn't he? But uh, I, I think I don't know. I, li I like the more. I think Pope's a good keeper. Um. I th I, yeah, I just think I just think Pickford's a young lad in in goalkeeping terms, isn't he? He's he's he, he sort of makes these little mistakes because you know he. I'm not, I'm not hammering him in any way, but he, he hasn't really matured yet as a keeper, has he? Keepers come into their own about 30 plus, don't they? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, Mark here. Uh, this is more of a thank you, I think, James. Um, so, red card, Everton. Um, Arsenal fan, so thank you very much for headbutting William Gallus because I'd love to have done it years after that. <laughs> I didn't headbutt him, I just sort of ran into uh, him. With your head? <laughs> he was in the way. <laughs> I hear, look, no, here, it should have done it. If I could have done it years ago at Birmingham, I would have done it. <laughs> Olin, do you want to ask again? Hi James, I would really like a career in football. Hopefully, would you have any tips to progress towards a football career? Um, yeah, I think I think I, I mentioned a few of them before. Um, it's going to take dedication, um, perseverance, um, being able to deal with with you know 
the, the disappointments that will come your way and, and having the strength of, of character and the strength of mind to to um, keep your eyes on the prize, which is obviously a, a career in football. Um, I think the, the, the time investment in, in yourself and in what you want to do um, would have to be huge. And as I say, there will be times when you'll have to sacrifice not seeing your friends and not being able to do what your mates are going to do. But if the sacrifice is big enough, you'll give yourself the best opportunity you can in, in achieving what you want to achieve. Thank you. Thanks, mate. He's up next. Um, Simon Thornton. Hi, James. How you doing? Hi. Uh, I just wondered how um, how does the psychology of being a player differ from being a coach, or does it? Once you turn, you know, you're flipping from playing the game to being almost told how to play the game. Now, as a coach, how do you relate that back to a player? Um, well, I think I think uh, a lot of it's to do with 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 you know your own personality and and how you want to um, transfer that knowledge. To, to the players that you are coaching now. Um, I've always been a, a, a person that, what, that wants to help people. Um, I understand what it's like to, to be coached as a younger player and then as a more senior player. Um, so I can always refer to the, the feelings that I had, you know, when I, when I was a player um, and then transfer it into how then I would maybe maybe treat the player that you're coaching um i think there's it, it's definitely linked to you, to your personality and and as i say i'm i'm a person that wants to wants to help um the younger you know the younger players and the more senior ones achieve what they want to achieve um so however i can do that um then you, you have to, as a coach, you have to find a way because you're dealing with, you know, say in a typical dressing room, you're dealing with 20 to 25 different people, different personalities, um, different motivational triggers, you know, whether, whether they be, you know, I don't want to be intrinsic or extrinsic. You have to understand um, the, the person that, you, that you're coaching. Um, because and would you do any sort of external qualifications or, or studies for that, or do you, is it just from knowledge and from other coaches and things? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, if, if you, if you want to coach, uh, you have to, you have to have the, the qualifications that will be able to, you know, uh, justify your coaching. You have to take the, the um, uh, licenses and uh, you know the safeguarding and everything like that. Um, to be able to put yourself forward for, for any position that, that might come up. Um, but of course, you, 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 you call on your experience, uh, uh, you know, as, as a player. I've been a co coach or, ma you know, manager firstly, but a coach for, for nearly eight years now. Um, I've learned a hell of a lot. I've learned um, a hell of a lot from the coaches that I've worked with. Um, I've learned a lot from... Uh, Stuart's brother Gary, you know, who's a a, a very good manager, um, and of course you, as you as as I went through my playing career and and now my coaching career, your network grows. So I've got a few, you know, quite a lot of people that I can I can call who are more experienced than I am, who have uh, been in you know many more situations than I have, um, and I, I can call them for advice or. How, how to deal with a, spe a specific um, event that's uh, arisen or, or a specific situation. Um, but mo yeah, most of it is, 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 is that, is, is your own experience, what you've learned. Um, I, I attend a lot of webinars these days um, that have you know, speakers that are in, in professional positions. Um, but yeah. I, I don't think there's any any better way of learning than than being in a situation yourself, um, and and being 
as prepared as you can be, whatever that situation is, to be able to deal with it in the best way, to be as productive an outcome as it can be. And I'm always, I'm always willing to learn, and you know, I'm always, I'm always open-minded to to new things, and I don't, I tend not to totally dismiss anything. Um, I look into it, and then, you know, if it, if it's if it's not for me, then. I'll take what I want from it and then implement that into whatever coaching strategy um, is needed at the time. Thanks, cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Have one next from Matthew Kilner. Uh, yeah. Um, if you were being beat, what would you? What would keep your spirits up uh, for the rest of the match? Um, I think I think again, just that 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 mental strength, belief belief in yourself, belief in you in your team, um, belief in in what you're trying to do, um, and a lot of that for me, anyway, goes goes back to to you know your process and how you, how you've prepared for the game because if you haven't done that, it'll always be in the back of your mind. Um, but if you're confident. That you've done everything right, then you can then, you know, go on and, and perform and, and try and inspire your team to to either get a, a goal back or to get an equaliser. Um, you can do that in a, in a number of ways. You can do it, you know, verbally by the encouragement or or by action. Um, and as I say, everybody's different. Um, so the one the one thing if I if if I saw a teammate. Or, or a teammate saw me being brave and trying to get the ball and, and close down and um, that would inspire me and hopefully inspire teammates to, to do the same and that would probably be the best way of, of getting back into a match is that you know you never give up and you, you, you play right until the end. Cheers. Thank you. James, can I just ask one? Um, when when did you decide that you wanted to go into coaching, um, and how did you start your coaching path? Was it academy football, or did you go straight in at senior football or first team football? Or yeah, well, I was I was I was playing for Accrington, um, and I I was I was obviously a senior player in the dressing room, and I was only. I was only going to be playing for them for, I went in November and I was going to train and play with them until January of that year, uh, until the window opened. And then but I enjoyed it that much, you know, lo looking after the, the younger players and, and trying to teach them good habits and, um, you know, trying to give them the tools to, to progress the careers that I, I felt compelled to stay because we were flirting above the the relegation zone. So I thought I can't I can't walk out on them. Uh, so I I decided to stay till the end of the season. Um, and I remember we stayed up on the last day of the season. Um, and just to to see the joy in the faces uh, and to be part of of that journey was was brilliant for me. And um, probably. You know, it was up there, not the best, but one of the best experiences because of how it, how it turned out and how, how it made me feel about myself and about the team. Um, and then I remember going to the awards evening um, and in the January, there'd been a film crew come in and they filmed this, and, uh, this, uh, this film and we didn't know what it was, but they showed it at the end and we'd managed to stay up on the last day of the season, as I said. Um, and it depicted the depicted Accrington Stanley going out of the Football League. Uh, so they obviously thought we were going to go down. And it depicted, you know, a, but what they didn't realise, there was, there was 20, 20 young lads in there that were trying to forge a career in, in professional football. And for them to watch this video, I wasn't happy at all. Um, and I was I was quite angry because I you know I was experienced but I actually knew what the message was behind the film. 
So I went and got the uh, producer, who was a woman, and I told her what I thought of the film and what I thought of her um, disrespecting the club in such a way. Um, one of the founders of the Football League, uh, and she said, um, I didn't swear at her or anything, I was quite calm, but I remember her saying, oh, you can't talk to me like this, I'm going to find your chairman, and the chairman was stood behind me. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I agree with everything you've just said. So I felt compelled to defend the boys and the, and the team that I played in for the last seven or eight months. Um, but not, not just because, and I felt compelled to defend the club as well, because I thought it was bang out of order. Um, and then about three, three weeks later, the chairman rang me and he said, you, you love this club, don't you? I said, chairman, I used to play my school cup finals on this ground. And he said, right, okay. Um, and then subsequently the manager left and he rang me about a week later and he said, do you want the job? And I said, yeah. So I, 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 I'd, I'd, I'd imagine myself continuing to play, whether it'd be at Accrington or somewhere else. But that opportunity was, was probably too good, you know, even though it was Accrington. Um, it was too good to turn down because I, you know, I understand how hard it is to get into coaching and I thought it'd be a, a great first step for me. And had you started your coaching badges before that opportunity or? No, no, as I say, no, no, because I hadn't uh, envisaged myself playing. I was going to start on probably the next year or the year after. I wanted to play till I was about 38 and I was only 34. So um, it hadn't come, but I had to, to be able to manage in the league, I had to have my B licence. So the job that I had at Accrington was, was pretty full on because um, there was only a few people at the club uh, and I had to do my level two on my B licence within three months or else the league were going to say that I couldn't manage. Yeah. Which was, that was, that was pretty interesting, three months. Intense. Probably had about 10 minutes to myself. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, Thomas? How can you improve your speed? How can you improve your speed? Um, well, it depends, well, I don't know whether you can improve your speed by improving your technique at running or making sure that you're being efficient with your your power that you have and making sure that it's uh, giving you the, you know, the trajectory and the forward um, motion that you need. So I think there's, there's a lot of uh, work maybe to be done there, but obviously most of it comes from efficient power, but then I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know how old the lads are, so I don't want to tell them to go and start doing squats and stuff like that, and then they get injured. But um, a lot of your speed will develop with your age as well, because your muscles will get stronger, and um, the more you, the more you train, you know, if you can do um, sprint specific training, that will make you quicker as well. But I think probably the probably the biggest way you could improve, um, especially you know at, at your age, Thomas, would be to probably improve technique and efficiency with power. Hi, hey, Thomas. I was never the quickest, Thomas. Not not over the first five yards anyway. But when I got going, I was all right. Simon, do you want to go again? Thank you. Were you sad to retire from playing or happy because you can play more golf? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you heard my story uh, before when I, at the first game at Newport. 
Um, but I, I mean, you're, you're always going to be sad because it's such a big part of your life. Um, but like I say, I had, a, I, had a, I had a different focus. I sort of said to myself at that time that, you know, maybe not at that time, but over time I've, 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 I've dealt with it. I understand that, uh, you know, my playing career is over and I'm starting out on a new journey now, which I want to be, you know, as good, if not better. At. So I, w I was sad. Yeah, of course, but only because it was such a big part, part of my life. But as I said before, again, I, I, I love what I'm doing now and, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great way to stay involved, but I, I feel privileged in the positions that I've been. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the future. Thanks. You're welcome. That's me through all the questions in the chat. Has anybody else a question they'd like to ask or? Yeah, um, I've got one more. Go ahead, Jack. Okay. Um, James, how do you think a hostile away card affects your mindset and performance on the pitch? Well, personally, I used to love it because if if a, if a, if the crowd is being hostile towards you as an individual, you know, then you obviously pose a problem to their team, and they see you as a threat. So as a motivational one for me personally, it was great. I used to love it. <laughs> um, but if, if, I mean, if, if that happens to you, then just, you know, say, oh yeah, they, well, they must be worried about me because they're, you know, they're giving me stick. That's how I interpreted it anyway. And it was, it was usually right. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Me. Yeah. Me. Braxton, Braxton Blades got another one. <laughs> if you could go back and play for any team you played for before, who would it be and why? Well, I'm going to have to say Sheffield United now, aren't I? <laughs> yes. Because Mum's there and she's asking you to ask these questions, isn't she? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. Um. Yeah. I mean, I'm. I. I. I love my time at Sheffield United. You know, I, I did. I actually, I. You. Your mum would be interested in this. I didn't want to leave. I went. I remember Kevin Blackwell pulled me into the office and he said, uh, we, "We were flying at the time. I think we were in third position, and we were all in the dressing room. We were all talking. Yeah, we're going up. We. We had." An unbelievable team and um, I remember Kevin Blackwell pulled me in and he said oh the chairman says I've got to sell you and I was like no I'm not going anywhere he said and he said oh no I can't believe it I said well, why he said I don't know he's trying to cut back or whatever we I still don't know the reason why but I think I was on I think you know, it was it was the January transfer window. I think I had about twelve goals already, um, and as I say, we were, all we were talking about in the dressing room was we were going to go up. Um, but yeah, I was I was gutted. I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to get us up. Thanks. So if it was again, I'd I'd say to the chairman, "No, I'm not going anywhere." And then we'd have got promoted that year. I'm staying. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Scott McAllister. Hi, James. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good. How did you feel when you signed your first pro contract and who was the first person you told? Um, yeah, it, it, it was it was a... It was a, a well, a, not a tricky one, but it was. I, I had a decision to make. So, my dad, my dad was a, a truck driver, and he 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 worked every hour that God sent, and he remortgaged the house twice to send me to school. 
and I was good at school and I liked school um, and I wanted to go into medicine when I was younger because I never thought that I'd be a professional footballer. So when the time came for me to leave school and either go and do, go to, go to Blackburn or go to do my A-levels, it, it was a tough decision. Um, and I always remember my dad sat me down and he said, the decision is yours. And at that time, I didn't understand about, you know, what he'd done to, or what he'd sacrificed to send me to school. I just said, I'd like, I'd like to give it a go because I knew that I, not that I had the ability, I just wanted to, if, if, if that didn't, ha if that didn't work out, then I could always fall back on my education and, and go back to school. But if I, if I went to school and I never gave football the opportunity, you'd always be wondering what if. So that's, that's sort of how I rationalised it in my own mind. Um, and what I didn't know as well, that my dad used to negotiate on behalf of the union of truck drivers. So he was quite savvy when it came to contracts and that. And um, I think Blackburn at, at the start, they offered me a, a two-year YTS and a one-year pro. And my dad said, no, um, that's not, it's not good enough for my son. <laughs> um, so I think he, my dad, it was my dad who, who did uh, all of my deals up until I was about 24. Um, because it, for the football club, it was just my dad sat there, but he was re like really experienced and really good at negotiating. But he never used to say anything to me, what we'd always talk when we got home. Uh, so he, he negotiated a one-year YTS with a two-year pro, which means I signed my first pro contract at 17 when I was at Blackburn. Um, and it was it was amazing. I think when I started off as a YT, I was on £27.50 a week, which, you know, uh, it... it I was still living at home, so I had I didn't pay I didn't pay me mum any any board or anything like that. But um, so I used to save up for about three or four weeks and then buy a Ralph Lauren shirt from Blackburn and wear that on a, you know, thinking I was the nuts and that um, <laughs> back in the back in the nineties. Uh, but yeah, it was it was great. I think I went on two hundred and fifty pound a week my first contract. Thanks, James. It was great, especially playing, you know, for you, for the team that you supported all your life as well. It was, it was great. Thanks, Stephen. Stephen Gills. Gills. Hi, James. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thanks for taking your time. Uh, firstly, I have to question you about uh, how you could say so. Campbell was a better defender than Eddie King, and. Uh, would, do you not when he was at Arsenal? When I said when he was at Arsenal, uh, <laughs> he was a better player when he was at Arsenal before he went before he went to Spurs. Um, do you uh, are you happy enough uh, having learnt the game under the old school, you know, coaches, or do you wish now that you had still been at say playing at Southampton recently with under the likes of Potch and Kuman and Hasselhoffel? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think any, any, any player would, would not enjoy, you know, playing under, under those sort of managers. Um, I, I get that the game's changed. The, the game has changed, as I mentioned before. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the ways that we used to play are not lawful anymore, you know, let alone uh, employed. Um, but yeah, I think the, the game evolves all the time and, and we as coaches, we have to, we have to remain on trend and, and try and foresee the, the new trends or if, if we can see them uh, coming. Um, there are definite trends within football now um, that, that obviously we, we try and prepare our teams for and we try and counteract. Uh, but football will always revolve in, 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 or, or evolve, but in cycles, so everything will be what what's not trendy now will be trendy in ten years. What's 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 not trendy, or, or what's trendy, you know, won't be trendy in in a few years. And it, and it always goes round in circles. It's been like that since, you know, since the day it was invented. 
but it's it's up to us to to find them trends and and to to act on them or to try and stay ahead of the curve. Uh, well, talking about staying ahead of the curve, coaches, you know, learning the game like us, uh, look to you know guys like you or whatever, you know, for examples of drills and things like that. There, who do the professional coaches, you know, who who do you look to to improve yourself? Yeah, well, that that's a, a on ongoing um, all, all the time. I, I probably, you know, the same as you, looking at uh, how other managers work, and um, there's some there's some great apps on on th- that you can get hold of. Um, there's some great good people to follow on Twitter as well, YouTube. Um, I'm sure they watch a lot of the managers that are are on there, and then you try and adapt. Uh, your sessions to to how it would suit your players or or, or how it would suit your personality. Um, I think there's some there's some there's, there's the great thing is we've got access to so much more now as coaches. Um, but I find that that coaching is is a thing to be shared as well. But I think the, there's there's quite a few coaches that try and want to. You know, keep everything to themselves if they if they if they know things or. But I think it's it's a platform that should be shared, and we we should be, you know, sharing what what we know, and then you can adapt it any way you want to to your team or how your team play, uh, and get the things in that you you want to put into your team because obviously that's yours. But the amount of resources we have as as coaches uh, or the access is is virtually unlimited. Because you know training sessions and they're all over the internet. Um, as I say, there's, there's there's some there's some good ones on Twitter to follow that have little drills, and then obviously you 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 make them work for whatever age group you're working with, or or you you know you make them tougher if you're working with seniors or or easier, and then you you get the progressions in. I think it's just de- you know developing yourself and and and. Uh, you know, trying to trying to speak to other coaches as well, and, and develop your network, and, and and not be shy to to say, oh well, I you know I, I like this, or you know what what do you think? I think there's a, a bit more that the coaches could do with that as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, Adam Topping. Cheers, Chris. Hey, hey James. Uh, good listening tonight, Tom. Insightful answers there. Um, just a couple of wee questions. You talked earlier on there about the England team being clicky whenever you joined up. Do you think that's part of a reason why they underperformed in, in quite a lot of tournaments in recent years? And obviously, you can see now, obviously, we're Southgate at the helm, that that clickiness seems to have gone. I think there's a lot of, you know, more youthfulness about it. And what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think I think Paul Scholes alluded to it in his book, didn't he? I think. It, it, he, he thought uh, I, I wasn't really around enough, but he was he was involved a lot more. But if you're asking for my opinion, probably because and then you know going back to a previous answer as well, the more successful teams that I was involved in, we all had a, a great team spirit. We you know we were we were all playing for the badge. We all understood what our role was within the team, but you know, you know, you don't necessarily have to like each other. But we we understood each other. We knew what that we had each other's back. You know what I mean? And it it, it was that there's a we that's, so if I take Southampton for example, we we were a you know on on paper we just we were an average team really, but with the spirit we had. With the teamwork and communication and having each other's back, we then became a very good team. You know, getting some great results. Um, fin- I got the highest finish in the Premier League for the club, and we wouldn't have done that without that team spirit and the, and the respect we had for each other. Um, so of course, you, you you see the success of that. And 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 what Gareth's done with the England setup and and how far they've come uh, in regards to 
you know, maybe maybe they overperformed a little bit in the World Cup, but it's a that's a young team, isn't it? So in 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 two or four years, come come the next big tournaments, they're going to be two or four more years experienced, get to know each other. They they'll have played at club level for that that amount of time as well. Um, but there's a lot to be said for um, for team spirit and camaraderie. Um, I'm sure you have it with, you know, with with your teams, and I, I know my son. They just love being with the mates, you know, and 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 all of a sudden they go and play together, and you know, they're a good team. Or what? Yeah, there's even at that level you can see it the camaraderie between players, and I think as well I mentioned about cycles. I think we went we went totally the other way in going. This is only a few years ago. Totally technical, um, camaraderie doesn't matter. But now it's becoming more popular because, you know, Gareth's doing it at England. Or I think, I, I, but I always thought as a as a player and and as a coach, there's a lot to be gained. You know, you, you, it can give you an advantage if if your team is on the same page and they've got respect for each other. They know they're all, they know each, each other's jobs as well as their own. You know they've got they've got the teammates back. If he, if your teammate gets in trouble, you know you know somebody's going to be there to help him out. It, it it can give you that extra edge in games. I've experienced it as a player and and as a coach. Yeah, um, just just a, another one that's sort of coming along from that. Um, having obviously mentioned about the teams you've been, who's been the best and worst manager? I don't know. You mentioned obviously the influences you had with Al Irvine, but uh, the best and worst manager and and why? Uh, the good the good thing about coaching is is you 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 can you can learn what what to do or what not to do. So having you know, um, so you're so you're always learning. Um, but the best manager probably Strachan, um, because he he was, at that time he was just great for me. He knew how to get the best out of me. Um, I, I knew where the line was, um, and he, he was he was brilliant, great character. You've seen his one, you've seen his one-liners on in the press. He was like that all the time, and he had, like he allowed himself to be, you know, taken the Mickey out of a little bit, but not too much. So he, he's my, he, I always say that he's my favourite one. Um, the the worst one, Tony Pulis. Why, why was that, James? Out of curiosity. I uh, don't know. Just not a very nice person. Right, okay. Mm. Thanks, sir. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Okay, there's one through here in the chat. I'll read it out as he's had the goal, but that can be maybe our last one. As an assistant manager, James, how much input does the manager let you have during the game? Um, I've got a, I've got a great relationship with Gary. Um, we've known each other for twenty years, and it it allowed that the, our relationship is obviously, a, you know, he's he's my he's my friend, and I care about him. Um, but he's my boss. But he's. He, he respects me. I, we've got a, a huge mutual respect, and I, I can say, you know, if I think he's doing something wrong, or I can make suggestions to him at any time. Now we might not see eye to eye all the time, and you know, we 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 have we have cross words, but as soon as that's finished, we we understand that it's, you know, it's done. There's no there's no grudges. There's no, you know. Um, feeling sorry for yourself or whatever. Um, but I have total respect for, for Gary as, as my boss um, and as, as one of my friends as well. So I think it's quite, it's quite a unique one where, you know, I can, I can basically say anything to him, um, you know, within, not that I'd say anything bad to him, but I, 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 I'm, I'm not scared to voice my opinion. 
and and he he so he, he he welcomes that. That's the sort of environment he wants to create within his staff. Um, he wants he wants he wants to be challenged. If you, if you think that things can be done uh, a different way, um, but then ultimately when Gary makes that decision, you you you're behind him hundred percent, which is exact exactly how we, how we do it. Is the coaching side of things where you want to be, or do you want to manage? Do you want to? Um, I've said to, I've said to Gary in, in the future. You know, he's he's aware of it. Um, but at, at the moment, I've you know I, I like where we are. Um, and until he says that he he doesn't want me to come with him, then it'll be uh, it'll be that. I'm, I'm sure. I'm I'm sure. I'm sure he will. But like I say, I don't take anything for granted. Uh, but I think I think he's you know, as I say, we've got enough respect for each other to to be to be open. And as I say, as I said right at the start, he's a he's a very good manager. Um, you know, he, he he's 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 so thorough. Maybe maybe too thorough at times. You know, when he when he could give himself a little bit of time. Um, he's, he's football, 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 hundred um, percent. Sometimes he just needs to give himself a little break, take a little bit of time out, chill. Um, but I suppose it helps. It helps as well that we can we can sort of click into into mate mode and have a little bit of a relax. Um, I'm conscious of it because I, you know, as I said at the beginning, I care for him and I don't want to. I don't want him to. You know, get gain any ill health with it, but he's uh, he's 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 getting better at that. I think he's getting better. He's um, not not chilling out a bit, but he's he's he's, he's realizing that I think allowing himself time is is more beneficial in 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 the long run. Um, and he's uh, as I say, I I, I love working with him and. As long as he wants me there, I'll be there. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Thank you very much for coming on. Appreciate it. Really, really appreciate it. No yeah. problem. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, this is a series of Q&As and webinars that we're doing. Obviously, we've got Jerry Taggart on next week. And then we have Lee Dykes coming in in a couple of weeks. He's the head of director of recruitment at Brantford. So couple of other ones to look forward to and um, James I'd just like to thank you on behalf of everyone that was super really good thank you thanks for having me thanks very much thanks James, James. stay safe everyone thanks James thanks James thanks James thank you thank you thank you James thank you thank you thank you thanks James thank you thank you thank you See you later, Braxton. Bye. Thanks, Bye. guys. We are blades. <laughs> <laughs>